Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. Today we're joined by Bhushan Ekbote, who's currently leading sales planning and strategy at a, a small company you may not have heard of called Dell. Uh, Bhushan, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Tom. And I, I'm super excited about this one because we have on the on the CV almost, we have companies, I mean, way back in the day it was Tata, but then more recently we, we've had Magento, which I'm assuming most people listening to would be aware of, the e-commerce platform, and also now Dell. So these are, these are, these are big names. Um, from the chat before, you, you shared that actually your sweet spot was a, within a sales ops team of around 10 uh, with a, a, a managing sales reps of between 200 and 400. So we'll touch on that. But, but I also do want to dig into kind of what's going on today at Dell and how sales ops works in, the, in these large companies. But to, to kick off, can we understand how you first entered this, this field? Sure thing. Um, by, by accident, in the, in the fair honesty, uh, about 12 years ago, I was working on the, the supply side of the business, uh, which is, you know, I come from a product, I have an engineering degree, um, I'm a mechanical engineer from Michigan State University, and I was working on uh, a product which was, you know, uh, which was selling uh, in a commoditized market. We were selling hard drives, and uh, you know, that's so. That was the time when I was working at Seagate, and that was a time when I got introduced with the demand side of the business, and I got really intrigued by the demand forecasting, uh, the the eighteen months, the twenty four months cycle that they predict and the models that they build in. And this engineering brain of mine got really intrigued to it. And when there was an opportunity where Seagate was uh, spinning off and coming up with a Seagate cloud division, I raised my hand and I said, I want to do this. I want to do the demand planning. And I started picking up bits and pieces of that. And through my six and a half years at Seagate, I touched a lot of aspects of Sales operations. You know, you, when you work in a company for that long, you you can raise your hand and be the first person to say, "Hey, I'm going to do compensation. I'm going to do quota planning. I'm going to do territories," and and you just you know try to get as much as you can and to grow your portfolio. And and because sales ops, you know, to me was such an exciting field, I just jumped onto it and it just attracted. Uh, got attracted to a lot of uh, awesome things sales ops offer since then. Well, so I, I totally understand. We get this answer a lot. What do you think was it about sales operations that attracted you? Uh, the dynamic, uh, the, the sense of such a dynamic environment that you play in when you are dealing with sales, if you're dealing with revenue, you're talking about the variables that are in your control, not in your control. You know, you know on one hand, understand how your product offering is. On the other hand, you have no idea how macroeconomically things are going to change or look different. Just dealing with salespeople just takes a different sort of energy out of you. There's no boring day when you're working on working with sales reps. Got it. Um, and then over your career in the various roles, what if you could pick out the kind of best-in-class tech stack from that experience and, and you could create any tech stack, what would you include in there? You don't have to include brand names, but what, what tools are you, would you be looking for? No, sure thing, sure thing. Um, so so when I think about tool stack, I think about, you know, from the start part of the funnel, the top of the funnel. Of course, you know, we have CRM, you know, we have used Salesforce pretty much across all of my experiences. On the top of the funnel, where we have the marketing side of the business, of course, we had Marketo, but you know we have lean data that kind of connects the, the contacts to accounts. We got full circle inside that takes care of the attribution on you know, what was the first time a customer into prospect interacted with us. Then in terms of a data acquisition, we have used Bradstreet, Zoom Info, uh, Discover Org. And when it comes to the SDRs going out and creating a cadence and connecting with uh, the prospects, I've used Outreach.io. And on the forecasting side, uh, once we have uh, the lead converted into opportunity, we have used uh, DataHug, which is now part of Calidus Cloud and had a super success with that. Uh, we use uh, Salesforce CPQ, which is, uh, I think, 
uh, is another tool that they Salesforce purchased and rebranded that as Salesforce CPQ. Um, and then on the compensation side, we use exactly. Uh, we also tried on gamification platforms. Uh, so we used uh, uh, inside sales.com, we used Hoopla, and they produce amazing results because sales reps are not only motivated by money, they're motivated by the, the how they're leading against their their peers. So when you have a leaderboard uh, that glorifies their success, it acts as a great motivation. So we used that quite a lot. Awesome. Now, coming up to today and Adele, can you explain the, the structure of the sales and sales of teams just briefly so we can get an understanding of, of how this, this machine works? Sure thing. Um, so Dell is going through an interesting transformation right now. Uh, Dell acquired EMC about five years ago, and that acquisition has become been really successful. Uh, until now, I mean, this is a public knowledge. Uh, Dell was working on uh, two parallel sales organization. There was a sales organization that came from EMC, and there was a sales organization that was a legacy Dell uh, sales organization, and structure was looking really good. Um, now, uh, what happened as a natural transformation was one of the sales leaders uh, retired, and that gave Dell an opportunity to consolidate the sales structures and merge them together. Um, so totally, we are talking about sales folks, uh, including the specialties, um, support structure of about 30,000 sales reps at Dell. Um, that means the, the sales planning strategy, sales operation teams are pretty big as well. Um, I have a feeling that it's about 1,000 to 1,500 uh, folks that sit in sales operations, um, supporting these various types of products and sales offerings. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure this is the biggest sales ops and sales team we've had. We had American Express, but I don't think they had 30,000 sales reps. Um, can we, like, as I mentioned at the start, you, you're, the, majority, the majority of your experience has been in sales ops teams of about 10 with two to 400 sales reps. What's different now? You have much more volume. So what you get to do now is... So Dell number one, although it is such a big organization, it doesn't feel like it. And I think there is something awesome about the culture that Michael Dell built uh, that doesn't make it look bureaucratic organization. It is very dynamic, very aggressive, very agile, changes direction in a hard bed. Um, so very different than you know what you would think about as a, as a big organization. So so what I get to do working at Dell, uh, which is different than you know working in a smaller organization, is I get to, well, now I'm working in a global transformation uh, team, which basically is, uh, you know, looking at that thirty thousand spectrum and see what is the best use of the resources that we have, and how do we maximize these resources potential to get to the the profits that we have not seen before. Dell always believe in this theory of abundance, where we say, hey, uh, the market is bigger than what we are capturing right now. And how do we, how do we get the, the, how do we make the pie bigger so that it's not about, you know, taking share from HP or other competitors. It's about how do we make, grow the pie bigger and find different ways of revenues. So what I get to do now is focus on a very strategic side rather than, hey, look at, the, you know, how a conversion is looking like. Uh, my day-to-day -day problems are looking at, a hey, how do we tackle a particular market segment that's underserved by Dell? And what kind of sales motion, if we play based on the historical data, would look historical as well as competition, would make us the, give us the biggest benefits? So it's a lot of uh, analytics, uh, a lot of data modeling, and thinking through the strategies. and. Um, I'm learning a lot of consulting side of the business. Um, given the fact that this role does look like a Bain or McKinsey type of role, um, so it's kind of developing or helping me build that muscle of, you know, how do we sharpen your presentations? Uh, that was one of the things that I missed out when I was working in a smaller organization where, you know, everybody is being scrappy. So you're pretty much just, you know, you know doing some quick decks and you're getting things out. However, at Dell, you're working at, 
polishing your material? How do you make your hypothesis the strongest? How do you produce a lot of data supporting your hypothesis? And at the end of the day, you are presenting to the big shots in the company that have power to drive you know, billion dollars of the revenue. So, so that's the scale. That's totally different. And uh, it's a great learning experience. Well, I can hopefully can offer some of the previous perspectives into this big mammoth of business. Over the past few weeks, we've spoken to a hundred sales leaders around the world to understand the impact of COVID-19 on revenue. And we've combined these insights into one single report that covers the immediate impact, the commercial outlook, the tech stack that you need, and actionable advice for sales leaders. You can claim this whole report completely for free if you go to ebster.com forward slash COVID. That's ebster.com forward slash COVID. For sure. Now, can you share a time, and this could be a Dell or it could be from any of your previous roles, where, where you've done something that's tangibly boosted productivity of a group of reps? Oh, many times, many times. Uh, so, um, so productivity is measured in multiple different ways. Uh, you know, you can think about a, a vantage point type of uh, uh, framework. I don't know if you've heard about that or not, where you're thinking about, hey, uh, are we measuring results? Well, the results can be measured, but they cannot be influenced. So what can be influenced is, you know, the activities. So when you think about, you know, how can you boost the activities, you think about different ways, such as uh, giving sales reps uh, data where they have, they have more time prospecting and they're not wasting time in looking for the contacts or looking for the leads. So when we, when we identified the ideal customer profile at Bizarre Voice and we created the, the exact model that will be converting the, the best and we were able to go to Zoom Info and retrieve uh, about 20,000 contacts that will match, uh, that just you know, slashed down 90% of the, the wastage that reps were having when they were just you know going out by themselves and without using any data model, looking and you know scraping through LinkedIn to find the right contacts. Oh, uh, so, that's, so, that's, yeah. so let's jump in. So b- b- before you did that activity, the reps were kind of free to, to do what they want. The reps, yeah. The, the reps were getting getting um, you know compensated pretty much just based on you know how many how many calls they make and you know the conversions were pretty low and and then afterwards we said hey hold on a second guys you know don't go to the random list this is the list you're going to go to and that just jumped their conversion rate to about eight times than what they were doing before yeah yeah that, i mean for sure like focusing on that persona and then Handing over the data for the sales reps is obviously going to be saving a chunk of their time. Um, next question is about in, in the last few months, I assume Dell has been working more remotely than, than previously. How has that changed the way you guys are working with the reps? Have you had to do anything else, invest in new tools, et cetera? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, Dell always had a mindset of remote work, uh, even before coronavirus, COVID started. There was a really good policy about working remotely, um, but when it comes to you know being a sales rep and you know working with client, that relationship has changed drastically in the last three four months. Uh, it has actually helped us improve on our business side because you know when we talk about a commoditized business such as Dell, uh, there is a there is an opex part that you think about, and when you cut down on the travel. Uh, definitely, there is an impact on the revenue uh, because of this pandemic. Uh, but the travel cut down, the opex uh, minimization, has helped us improve our uh, our margins. So definitely, that has helped in terms of tool stack. To be specific, um, we have not necessarily added any particular tool stack. Uh, Dell is rich with the tool stack that we already have. What we're doing now is we're just being really efficient on using those tools. Um, 
when sales reps are interact, when we are trying to influence, uh, you know, as a as a global transformation office, we don't have a direct impact on the decisions that they make. Uh, it was really useful when we were in person doing those conversations. Um, however, we just quickly realized that uh, it's not the in-person presence that makes the point stronger. It's the hypothesis, it's the data, it's the way you presenting uh, that makes the things stronger. Uh, so uh, somehow we have eliminated uh, the, the the slowness or the lack of impact that happens through the visual uh, webinar style, uh, Zoom style connection. And we were quickly able to connect the dots and provide the same kind of like influence over to the sales organization as we used to do prior to the pandemic. Sure. Um, can you briefly outline Dell's sales forecasting process? Um, well, I mean, Dell goes through a various different forecasting processes. You know, you think about an organization that is as big as 30,000 sales force, and then we have you know, multiple different product lines and a high level, you know, we think about three different product segments. It probably is, 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 is ever expanding in terms of, uh, in terms of the scope of it. So I would, I would probably hold myself on giving you a, 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 a read on Dell's forecasting process because there is no one Dell forecasting process. If I may, uh, I'll give you a read on how the, how the Magento forecasting process work. Is, will that work? Okay. Yeah, right. yeah, that's so, fine. So, uh, so uh, when we implemented Data Hug uh, at Magento, one of the one of the advantages of Data Hug was the way you can override the forecast of uh, your reps, or if you're a, a area manager, how you can override the forecast of the regional manager. Uh, you know, forecasting is a combination of art and science. So, what we used to do. Uh, at Magento was we will have a we will have a weekly cadence where on Wednesdays there will be a regional meeting which I won't take part in. Uh, it will be a regional level directors that will collect the forecast from the individual reps and submit their forecast in the system. On Thursdays uh, there will be a uh, uh, there will be a, a divisional level meeting, which is a level up where you're talking about the, the North America, EMEA, and Asia Pacific, which will be the meeting that I'll, I'll, I'll sit in. And then we will we'll kind of vet on that forecast that was submitted by the regions and we'll do the overriding. And we'll do it in two ways. Uh, you know, reps will have their numbers and their art part of it, where my sales operations team, you know, will have more mathematical approach. Uh, we will do the, the historical conversion rates. As so it's week eight, and we got a best case opportunity, and it's only you know fifteen percent probability that this opportunity will close. Uh, this will be kind of a logic we'll use to roll up the forecasts. Um, so that will be the meeting that I'll work with the, the divisional leaders to submit their forecast. And on Friday, uh, the global um, head of sales, the CRO, will take these numbers and he will he will look at you know his part of the adjustments and he'll submit his forecast to the executive leadership on Friday. So it literally was a three day process, literally done on a week to week basis, um, and we had about 97, 98 percent of accuracy um, going through this uh, for about. I never missed a forecast for eight quarters in a row wow. with this process. Wow. Next metrics. If you could only measure one for the rest of your sales <sighs> career, which would you choose? So, so again, this kind of like leads me back to the advantage point performance framework that I'm, I'm a huge fan of and have have gotten a great results out of it. Um, so the metric that can influence the performance are not based sort of results. You know, we're not talking about, hey, uh, let's figure out how your quota team is going to look like. That probably will be a lagging indicator. Um, the leading indicator probably or, or leading indicator probably will be uh, how's your pipeline looking like? So many folks, you know, try to track how your pipeline is trending. 
that can be a good KPI, but you cannot influence your pipeline directly. You know, you can influence the activities that you're doing. So what I have found most successful as type of daily indicator when I like wake up and look at it the first thing in the morning is the activities. So as a KPI, I usually track activities done by sales reps. And again, these activities will be different by sales organization. If you're talking about it, SMB sales organization that have a high high volume and a low deal size and a you know, quick closing cycle, uh, the activities are emails, phone calls. Uh, but as you're talking about the enterprise sales motion, your activities are more related with how many folks are attached to the deal because you know there is a matrix that says about you got to have about 11 to 21 based on the enterprise size of the organization folks attached to the deal. So if you are only working with seven or eight out of them, there's a high likelihood this deal is going to slip to the next quarter. So so that's kind of like the KPI I would measure, but it just, you know, so the activities, but the type of activity to be measured would be different across the organization. Yeah, and I had never really thought about that as an activity metric, like people attached to a deal. And I can't even fathom having to try to close a deal that has 20 stakeholders from the client. Like, that's amazing. Um, final question is, who, who in the world of sales ops has most uh, inspired or influenced you? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the, 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 the typical answer that I usually give is, the sales reps, right? You know, you talk to the sales reps or the head of sales and you understand how you're doing. Um, if your sales organization hates you for putting too much administrative burden on them, uh, that's one indicator of success. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, but, uh, you know, you do need to understand that. But I've, I've gotten a lot of good mentorship, a lot of advice from from amazing folks uh, that used to be consultants, that used to be like the thought leaders in the sales operations industry, call it, uh, you know, you know the, the uh, a few folks I'll probably name, uh, Sidna Kapan, uh, who is a chief customer revenue officer at uh, International Institute of Analytics, uh, Chris Simon from the Alexander Group, amazing guy who talks about compensations, he owns compensations like nobody else does. Um, Chris Dan from Bain Consulting, you know, if you're talking about influencing people without authority, which is, you know, how the consulting world works or, you know, sales operations work, he's the guy to go to. Um, on the academics, I, I do collaborate a lot with universities to do research around sales effectiveness. Uh, Professor Olivier Rubel from UC Davis Graduate School of Management has been one of the leading researchers in this industry and um, you know I, I just work with him and every time I talk to him I just found new nuggets that uh, that just increases and helps me to perform better awesome um, so I have, I have I've been writing notes that I had four things written down here but actually looking at them now there's actually two um, that I really liked about this and, and the first one is about your focus on activities and how they can help tweak or improve performance, but then also breaking down the relevant activities for the type of sales you're doing, e.g. the enterprise people attached to the deal. But then the second thing that I like um, is I think that you have a, a love, well, maybe not a love, a passion for salespeople because at the start you were saying how working with sales reps is never boring. And also at the end you were saying, I wrote sales reps here, but you were also saying something along the lines of, like, or, I, I just feel you have an appreciation for the for the, the skill, would you agree? Totally, totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's one of the things that most of the sales operation folks ignore upon. Um, but it's a it's it's a it's a really tough job to be a salesperson. So understanding their side of the world just makes you a really good sales ops person. Awesome, Bujan, thank you so much for coming on. It's been really good. It's my honor, Tom. Appreciate it.